Hello, family. Once again, we're back for our Bible study, our Sunday school lesson. Uh, I'm excited about this coming Sunday. The lesson is uh, as simple and as basic as it gets, but to me, one of the greatest or the greatest topic we could ever talk about is love. Uh, <laughs> I think I think about love, and it just makes you happy. Uh, love is an amazing thing, but but I'm going to say this, you know, when you think about love, I I still, I've, I've shared this several times, I still dabble a lot in my psychology. I have a, a degree in psychology from Mississippi College, and I like looking back and reading articles, reading some of my books, uh, some of the studies I've done, and, and <clears throat> now when you read psychology, you have to understand it is psychology, it is, is a, a science of man, so... Uh, a lot of it is bunk, but there's some good stuff. It's it, psychology is like any other science or any other um, intelligence of the world. What you have to understand when you separate any kind of intelligence from the Bible, you're gonna get a lot of bunk. You're gonna get a lot of garbage. Um, you have to come always combine the two. Psychology has some amazing, brilliant people, has some amazing thoughts, amazing theories. Uh, some amazing men and women that have come up with some amazing theories and um, have had some great success in studying uh, human behavior and, and thought. And, um, of course, then we move into philosophy, which really gets crazy. But I'm saying all that to say this. It's like, for instance, if, if any of you or if you're getting any kind of counseling from a psychologist or a psychiatrist, I mean, hey, we do what we have to do. Uh, I've been for counseling myself. Um, make sure that that professional person is a Christian. Because if you take psychology, if you take a psychologist or a psychiatrist without Christianity, I'm telling you, listen, you're taking your life in your own hands because there's no telling what you're going to hear or what, what they're going to say because it, it, it's not going to be right. I'm sorry. I make people mad, but it's not going to be right. If they, unless they cross it with the Bible, it's just not going to be right. So, and in saying that, as I was looking back and I was studying psychology, think about love. You know, we always we always say there's three types of love, and it's funny because, uh, again, if you go if you were to go to a website and just Google love, three types of love, you'll be amazed at the the stuff you will pull up. Oh, it, it, it's everything from um, fairy tale love they'll call it to first sight love or I mean, because it's all, most of it you pull up will be coming from a worldly view. And the Bible will have nothing to do with it. But if you go to the Bible, biblical view, then you, we always say there was three types. We always, I always heard it as, as phileo or philea. It's actually philea. It's, and it's really pronounced philia. Philia love. You have, and I always thought of three types of love, but. Over the years, as I've studied, I've realized there's really four types of love in the Bible that are described in the Bible. It's, it is the philia or the philia. It is a brotherly love. It's love we have for other brothers. Love I have for my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a brotherly love. Uh, then you have, you actually have another kind of a family love, like brotherly love, is called storge. S-T-O-R-G-E. Storage love. Storage love. It's this is a love between a mother and a child, or a father and a child. This is a very intimate love within the family. Uh, of course, then you have eros. We all know what that is. That's love between a man and a woman, a husband and wife, and that is a sensual or romantic love. But the greatest love of all, uh, which we're going to talk about, is agape love, and that's the love of our Heavenly Father. And this is a love that goes beyond anything our finite brain can imagine. Um, this love, if we try to wrap, we truly, if we try to take our finite mortal mind and wrap it around the love that God has for us and for this world, I'm telling you, it, it's, it's impossible. Um, in our scripture, we're going to be coming out of, of John chapter 15. And uh, in the scripture, what we find is we find Jesus talking with his disciples. And they had just left the upper room where he had instituted the Lord's Supper, the giving of his, his body and his blood. And 
Now they're walking and they're going to the, I believe this is the point where they're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, as, they're, as they're walking, um, he's sharing with them and he's talking with them and teaching. Always, always taking any opportunity to teach. And uh, as on the road, he, he is sharing with them the importance and the appreciation uh, of God's love. And again, this is uh, a love that, that goes beyond uh, anything we can really comprehend. Um, you know, I, I was thinking as, as I was doing this, this lesson, it's, uh, we are faced every day, from the minute we get out of bed, we're faced with decisions and questions. Uh, the alarm clock goes off. Should we get up? Should we hit snooze? Uh, I'll be honest with you. Now, I, I'm an early riser, but I set my alarm very early, and I, I'm not ashamed to hit the snooze. Uh, most times, many times, I get up before the alarm, but if I don't, and I'm, I'm really tired, because I've gone to bed later than usual, then I, I'm not ashamed to hit that snooze, and I know a lot of people wear snooze out, but we make that decision to hit the snooze. Then we get, do we eat breakfast, or do we not eat breakfast? Uh, and if we do eat breakfast, then what are we going to eat? Do we eat heavy? Do we eat light? Do we just have juice, you know? Uh... Are we going to exercise? I mean, it, it, the whole day is that way. It's these decisions. But what I've come to find out is it's not so much the questions and the activities of the days that are so important. It's how we react to them. I, I read this statement by Chuck Swindoll, what I thought was really good. He said, uh, this is straight from Chuck Swindoll, one of his books. It says, I'm convinced life is only 10% of what happens, happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. So what he's saying is it's our reaction. And it's the same way with this love. It's We're going to look into this lesson and it's going to be our reaction to this love. This love has been shared with us. This is um, the greatest love ever. This agape love, this love from our Father, uh, from God. And, and as I'm reading this scripture, um, I, again, I see three things here that, that I would like to point out. So let's read our scripture in, in John 15. Let's start reading verse 9, then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. We'll read 9, 9 through 14. Let's, let's begin at verse 9. As the Father loved me, this is Jesus talking, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends, and if you do whatever I command you, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. All right, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he's talking about this this love from him, this love from the Father, this godly, agape love. Um, and I think the first thing he's, he's trying to get his disciples to understand, if, if you're taking notes, the first point or the first thing I want you to see is the love appreciation. Look at verse 13. Greater love has no one than this. He laid down his life for his friends. It's the appreciation of the love that was given to us by the Son, by the Father, by the Holy Spirit. The love that is given to us by our God. Um, I am amazed when I think of John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life he so loved the world it, I would hope you know I, I talked with, with Randy um, Randy Price who's in charge of our security I talked with him many times about security you know, we talk about, you know, uh, would we be willing to take a bullet for somebody? I, I, I think I would. Now, I say that sometimes when we get in a situation, <laughs> we may not find we're as, as bold as we think we are. But I believe, I believe I would, I believe that I would risk my life for any one of you. I mean, look, church, you're my family. Church, I love you so much. I mean, I have family in Tennessee. I have brothers and sisters in Tennessee, but you're my brothers and sisters. And honestly, 
you're closer to me than they are. You are my family, and I love you, and I would do anything for you, and I believe I would take a bullet for you. If I could spare your life, I believe I would do it. Hey, I, I'm at a point in my life for me to live as Christ and die as gain. I believe that, but and I believe I would do anything to protect you. And I love you that much. But, now let me be honest. As much as I love you, number one, would I would I take a bullet for somebody I don't even know? Would I just, just see someone on the street and risk my life for them? I'm hoping that I would. I really do. I would hope that I would. And I think, I think that I might. But church, let's be honest. Would I allow one of my children to die? For someone else, that I'm gonna be honest, I, I I don't I don't think I could do that. I, I love my children. I mean, my, my priorities are God first, then my wife, then my family, and and for me to allow one of my children to die to save the life of someone else, especially someone I don't know, I, I, I can't I, I can't do that. Do you understand what kind of love I'm talking about? As I look at this picture that God so loved the world, and he's talking about, listen, our relatives. What's old, old Mark Lockery says, uh, we'll go spend holidays with our relatives, but we're not going on vacation with them. <laughs> because, you know, we, we love them. There's old saying, we love them, but we don't really like them. There's something we don't really like. And, but we have to love them, and we need to love them. And we, I don't want to jump ahead because we're going to get into that, but, yes, we need to love them. But God loves us. From the best to the worst, God loves them all. Now, the, 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 the deal is not all will choose him. Unfortunately, as much as he loves them, some will choose to turn away from him. Some will choose not to accept the free gift of life he has given in his son, Jesus Christ. I, I've said this countless times too. You know, this I've realized in my life that there's nothing I can do to make God love me more, but there's nothing I can do to make God love me less. God loves me. God loves me infinitely. God loves me uh, unfathomably. God loves me uh, from the deepest ocean to the highest sky. God loves me unconditionally. He loves me. And I have accepted that love. Um, God's love. What, what's that song? Uh, the song of God's love. Could we with ink the ocean fill, or if the sky of parchment made, if every earth on, if every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole if stretched from sky to sky. And I believe as Jesus is talking, he's trying to get his disciples to understand. And as we read, he's trying to get us to understand and appreciate. We need to really appreciate what God has done for us, the love that he has shared for us. And I call it an attitude of gratitude. You know, it's um, many years ago, I had a dream, and I, I think I've shared this dream before, but I'll share it again. Some of you have not heard it, but that God speaks to me through my dreams. Don't go running around telling everybody, oh, this dream, you had a vision. Well, you can call it what you want. I really don't care because I'm telling you, I have a very vivid dream of my imagination, and God speaks to me many times through my dreams. And one dream in particular, let me tell you how he speaks to me. One, one dream in particular, I used to do a lot of rock climbing when I was young. I lived in Tennessee. I stayed in the mountains. And I remember climbing, as, as I, the dream began, I was already on the side of the mountain, and I was climbing, and I was hundreds of feet up there, I mean, maybe thousands of feet. I remember I was really high, <laughs> very high. And I had no safety equipment, I was free climbing, I had no, nothing, no lifelines, nothing. I'm hanging on the side of this mountain, and I remember looking down, and I was really high, and as I looked at the top, I was very close to the top. And I thought, man, the top's a lot closer than the bottom, so I'm gonna keep going to the top. And I remember it was very easy to climb, plenty of handholds, plenty of rocks to grab, and I climbed. But when I got to the top, the top was, was slick. It was marble, just like a marble floor, and there was nothing to grab hold of. So I got all the way to the top, but then there was nothing to grab hold of. And I looked down a little ways, and I saw a pole 
a small pole in the ground. So I thought, well, I'll work my way over that pole. I'll get over that pole and pull myself up. So I remember getting over there, and the whole time I remember looking across the floor, I could see, barely see, I was high enough I could see, and there was a bench over here, and there was a man on that bench. I thought, man, why don't you come over here and lend me a hand? And I remember I got to that pole, and I hooked my arm around, I was pulling myself up, and just as I was pulling myself up, I thought, I'm going to make it. The pole gives way and breaks, and I, I, I'm feeling myself going back, which is like slow motion. As I'm going backwards, I see this man running toward me. And just as I'm about to go, he reaches down, he takes me by the hand, and he pulls me up onto the marble slab. And then he casually walks over, he sits back, sits back down on this bench that was there. He told me, come here, sit down with me. I'm sitting here shaking, quite, almost died. And I walk over and I sit down beside him and I looked at him. He said, look at this view. Is this not beautiful? And I'm thinking to myself, view? I, I, I was about dead. I was on my way a long way down. I was surely dead. And you, sir, saved my life. Now, how in the world could I ever repay this man for just now saving my life? An attitude of gratitude. There's nothing I could do to repay him, but I would spend the rest of my life trying to repay him. Do you understand that? We need to appreciate what has been done for us. And many times, I'm sad to say, we don't. We just don't. And I think we need to concentrate and always remember that should always be the, in the forefront every day in our thought and in our life. What God did for us. He gave his only son. I think about the angels as, as as Christ was being beaten and ridiculed and humiliated and then hung on that cross how the angels must have stood there with their muscles rippling and tears filling their eyes and running down their face and holding their sword and just waiting for the father to say go get him thinking why in the world would the father allow him to be persecuted like this to be humiliated like this to be to, to feel all this pain and the suffering and they were just waiting for that opportunity. The Bible says he could have called a legion, 10,000 angels, to come and take him off that cross. But he was silent. And the father was silent. And they watched as the son died. Do you appreciate the love that God has shown for you? Love, appreciation, agape love. But now, let's say we do appreciate it, especially right now as we're thinking about it. We have appreciation for the love. We do love God back, and we love, we show appreciation for, for the love of Him and the Savior, of what they did for us, what God did for us. But the second thing I see is verse, in verse 9 and 10 is a love assimilation. Look at verse 9 and 10. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. What he's saying is, okay, now we've shown love. Now you assimilate. You do the same and allow that same love to fill your life. In other words, assimilate. Um, it's Scripture emphasizes the importance of the concept of, of, of union and communion. Uh, there's always um, a concept in Scripture of unity is so important. Uh, it's just like in our church. Uh, first family, listen to me. I, our church, we have, uh, number one, it's Christ church. We know that Christ is the head of our church. God has blessed us with an amazing under-shepherd, a, a pastor that we love and, and, and I just... We are so thankful every day for, for the man that God has sent us. And we have some amazing leaders in our church. And we just have good people that are here. And we've seen amazing things happening in this church. And we're just it's just a good group, a good gathering of people. But understand something. With all that, church, if we don't have unity, we won't make it. If we don't have unity, we'll never completely see uh, what God has really in store for us. As we move into this new building, this new building is being built because of a people that are unified, unified in the mission of Jesus Christ, unified in evangelism for Fannin community and for Brandon and for wherever else he may send us. 
that unity is so important. And as I was looking through the Bible, there's so many examples of unity. Like 1 Corinthians 12 is the body and its members. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14, as the body is one and as many members, but all the members of, of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. He's saying we may be many people, but we must be unified as one body. The emphasis is, is again, on unity. And then um, in Ephesians, it's the bride and the bridegroom. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives. Jesus, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to him a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. He's showing the unity of the bride and the church. I mean, of the bridegroom, Christ, and the bride, church. He's showing the unity that must be there. So we must be one in unity. We must be one with Christ. We also shows unity in, uh, in John 10 of the sheep and the shepherd. In John 10, verse 2, it says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own shepherd, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Once again, we must be unified in Christ. We must be unified in the Holy Spirit. We must be unified with each other. Unity is so important and has so much to do with the assimilation of love. Uh, the marriage creates the union, but uh, it takes daily love and devotion to maintain the communion. We must assimilate the love that we see and appreciate in the Father. Do you understand that? There's steps to this. We appreciate it and we accept it. And, and then in turn, accepting it, we must allow it to fill us. Um, I'm always reminded of Romans 12. I love Romans 12. He starts right off in one. He says, I beseech you, I beg of you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is, your, which is your reasonable service or act of worship. In other words, he's saying it's not, remember I, I, I preached a while back that salvation is not a one-time thing. Salvation is a daily thing. It's ongoing. We've been, remember we, we talked about the first, first lesson we did, sanctification. We're being sanctified. We're being set aside every day for the service of God. So he's saying it's a daily service. It's a daily worship. And in saying that, but he says it's, it's the whole body. That, that's where we fail so many times. We allow God to have a heart, but we stop there. We must go on. In fact, he says in verse 2, uh, but be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's saying not just your heart, but your mind. You must give him your mind. And then you follow up with that. You give him your hands. You give him your feet. You give him your eyes. You give him your ears. You give him your whole body. You give him everything. That's being filled with the Spirit. When you allow the whole Spirit, the Spirit to completely fill you and completely control everything that you do and say. When I think of the mind, I think of a computer. These computers have been programmed with so much garbage from this world. And it's old saying, garbage in, garbage out. We got to get the garbage out and get the good in. We've got to allow God to fill this computer. And we've got to assimilate to, to the model of Jesus Christ and to the love of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and allow the Holy Spirit to assimilate us, to be the ambassadors, as we're going to move into that in a moment, to the ambassadors that we should be. So we see the love appreciation. Then we move into the love assimilation as we allow the Spirit to fill us and to control us and to fill us with that love. And, and that's why I say, I've made this comment several times, I hear pastors say, you know, you know, where Paul says, be ye being filled. In other words, you have to be filled every day. And they'll say, well, you have to be filled because you leak. Well, I'm telling you, we're supposed to leak. Okay? When I, I should be so full of the Spirit. When I walk into a room, I should just leak out. That Spirit should leak out all over the whole room. It should leak out all over everybody I come in contact with. You ever hear somebody just walk into the room and just the whole room just lighten up? 
That's the Holy Spirit of God. And that's the way it should be with all of us. We should be filled. So we have a love of appreciation. Then we have a love of assimilation. We allow God to fill us with that love. And that love to just fill us from top to bottom to overflowing. And then we have, finally, we have a love application. Okay? So we've seen the love. We've taken in the love of God. Now we begin to assimilate it. In other words, we've, we're abiding in that love. That's the word Jesus used, abide in my love. Become one with my, me and my love. Then once we do that, now we must apply it. There's an application. Look at verse 11, 12, and then we'll jump down to 14. These things that I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that you and that your joy may be full. I love that verse. We'll come back to it in a minute. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now jump down to 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So now, if we're going to apply, we have the appreciation. Now we've had the simulation. We've allowed the love to fill us, and we're striving to be like Christ. Now he says, now apply it. And the first thing he tells us is this. It's not a choice, church. It's a command. Uh, if you go to 1 Corinthians 6, I think down around verse 20, uh, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that you have in you that is from God? You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's anyway. Listen, it's a command. Once we accept Christ and we've allowed him to fill us and we've assimilated, tried our best to be like him and allow that love to, to fill us up, then we're to apply it, and he's commanding us to do it. In fact, is if we don't, he says, love like I loved. In fact, Scripture tells us in a couple more places that if we don't love, then we don't love him. If we don't love others, we don't love him. It's, it's a command. But also, if, if you back up to, to the fir our first point, it's an attitude of gratitude. He loved us so much, gave his son's life for us, why would we not love everybody else? Why would we not share the love that he has shared with us? It's a command, not a choice. And then go back to this verse. I love this verse. We're going to talk about it for just a second. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. It's not just a command. Listen to me, church. It's the road to happiness. Let me listen. There's no greater joy, to use his word, than sharing the love of Christ with someone else. I love it. I mean, any opportunity, just like doing all this mess going on, I've been, I've been able to deliver groceries to some people. I've been able to deliver medicine to some people. Uh, I try to call. I call and, and check on some people. I talk with people. Um, I do anything I can do, and, help. and some, and I have even people, it, neighbors in my in my neighborhood. Some that I really don't even know. If I can offer something to them that they need, I offer it. That's that's giving. That's the application of that love. It's you say, well, Steve. I just don't know when to do it, when not to. Listen to the Holy Spirit. It's just like the guys on the side of the road. When we go into Jackson, we see all these people on the corners begging for money. And you say, I, I, I don't know if I should give it to them or not. Then ask God. That's what I do. Church, I, I've got to the point where I let God let the Spirit prick me. And when I see those people on the street, I don't just ignore them. But I don't, I, I don't, I know they're there, but I just drive on past. Now you see, you see, you're being mean, but Steve, no, because I don't know what they're going to do with that money. And I'm telling you, some of those guys have pocketed a lot of money. Again, I'm not trying to take away from them, but if you'll listen to the Holy Spirit, a lot of times I'll drive up and the Spirit will prick my heart and say, bless him, bless her. And then I had, I even, I'm at the point now where I ask, okay, $5, $10, $20, bless them how? $2? And, and the Holy Spirit, you can believe me if you want to, but I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will guide me what to give and who to give it to. And when they prick my heart, and here's what I do. Listen, I don't just hand up the money. I'm going to say, okay, God told me to give you this. 
but you have to make me a promise. You have to make me a promise that this is going to go for good for your life. You're not going to spend on drugs. You're not going to spend on alcohol. It's going to go for food and for your needs, your necessities of life. you got to promise me that because God told me to give it to you. So me and him are both trusting you to do what's right with this money. And he said, Brother Steve, they're going to lie to you. They might. But guess what? They're not just lying to me. They're lying to God. And, then, and once I hand it over to them, guess what? It's, it's not on me anymore. It's on them. But God already pricked my heart and said, give it to them. And it even goes beyond that. Listen, church, there's times when I, 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 I keep a $100 bill tucked back in my wallet, all right? And it's mostly for emergencies in case somebody in the family needs cash. And I've had as much as a couple hundred back there just tucked back in the back. Uh, he said, Brother Steve, I can't, I can't keep $100. Well, that was a long time in my life I couldn't either. And I'm still, $100 is a lot of money to me. But I keep it for emergencies and I keep it for blessings. Because listen to me, God will let me know when to pull that out. I'll give you, for instance, many, uh, not too long back, well, I said not too long back, probably a year and a half so, uh, maybe two years, I was getting some tires from my truck and I was sitting in the lobby and as I was waiting, James, the guy who uh, has, I've always got my tires from for the past many years and he, his helpers were back to putting my tires on. James just so happened to be sitting at the, uh, standing at the desk and this girl walks in and she's getting a tire fix. And he tells her it'd be 20 something dollars, take the tire off, fix it, put it back on, blah, blah, blah. So she sits down, I see she's got a, I think it was a, a cracker rail uniform on going to work. And she, and as she sits down, she sits across from me and uh, I see her pulling her money out. She's adding up, okay, the tires gonna cost me this much, you know, and I got this much for groceries. And I'm sitting here looking at her and I'm thinking, and, and so I strike up a conversation. The spirit pricks my heart, I strike up a conversation. Well, hey there, how are you today? Oh, I'm good. I said, you counting your money, huh? She said, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure I got enough for everything. I said, well, I said, uh, and I started the conversation and she volunteered information. Again, look, she never asked for money. She never begged for money. She never gave me a sob story. She just began to tell me about her life. I said, what's your life like? And she told me. She said, I've got two children at home, no daddy. Uh, I work two jobs. I have to take care of me, give my kids a place to live and food on the table. And the daddy doesn't help very much at all, if any. And um, she's just telling me. She's not giving me a sob story. I asked her about her life, and she's telling me. And as she's talking, and the Holy Spirit begins to prick my heart. And I'm like, and he's like, okay, help her. All right. $5, $10, $20. Pay for her tie? You mean pay for her tie? No. Go to the rat hole money. So my daddy used to call it, he'd hide money in his wallet. We call it rat hole money. I don't know why, but go to the rat hole money. And I reached in there, I had a $100 bill. I pulled it out. And as we finished our conversation, I said, would you do me a favor? She said, well, I said, oh, would you please take this? I had it in my hand. I handed it to her. And she said, I, I, I wouldn't tell you on that for you to give me money. I said, I know you weren't. I said, but don't you listen to me? God told me to give you this. And at first she didn't want to take it. I said, please take it. And then she took it. She said, this is $100. She didn't realize that until she took it in her hand. And I said, yes. And God told me to give it to you. I said, you pay for your tire. I said, you use the rest of it for whatever needs you and your children may have. I said, I oh, don't you know that's, that it came out of my pocket, but that's from God. And God told me to give you that. And she teared up. And she said, you don't want anything in return. I said, no, ma'am, I do not. I want you to take this money and take care of your children. The joy. Listen. The application is not just for our joy, it's for others' joys too. Remember I told you, everything you do affects everybody around you. Now it gave me great pleasure to help this young lady out. It great, gave me great pleasure to, to obey God as he moved me to give her money, but it moved her and I had an opportunity to witness to her. Now, this is the key, listen to me. Who was taking all this in? James over the counter was taking it all in. As he as she left, because she just had one little tire fix, as she left, James looked big old black guy. He looked at me and he said, with tears in his eyes, he calls me preacher, preacher. I I've never seen anything like that before. Why 
Why did you do that? Because now I begin to explain to him. Do you understand? That's, that's the application. It's the joy. And it's not just monetary. I'm not just talking about giving people money. I'm just talking about a helping hand. I'm just talking about a kind word, encouragement to somebody. If you, if you feel like blessing somebody out, stop. Stop. And let that love, stop and appreciate the love that God has given for you. Stop and assimilate the love of Christ and assimilate that spirit and let that love fill you up and then apply it. And instead of blessing that person out, turn it into love and encourage them. And that person that you find hardest to love, I promise you this, if you will get on your face before God for them and pray for them on a regular basis, God will change your heart with that person. Now, it's not going to change what they did, whatever it is. It's not going to change any of that. It's not going to change the kind of person they are. But I'm going to tell you what it will do. It will change your heart. And it will give you joy unspeakable. The application. It's a command. And it is the road to happiness. Love. God's love. Do you deserve it? Do I deserve it? No. But that's why it's love. Do other people deserve it? No. That's why it's love. It goes beyond the boundaries of who deserves it. It is unconditional. And it is overflowing. I love you, church. I hope you know what a blessing you are to me. And I hope you know how much I miss you. Oh, I miss you so much. Y'all stay safe. And always remember, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is so good. Goodbye.